Hi everyone, I'm Scott Nicklin and welcome to this Farmington Police Department community discussion. I'm here with uh, fellow members of the Farmington Police Department who will be having a conversation about a number of topics this evening and we want to thank the resources of San Juan Safe Communities and Greg Allen. This is the studio that we're using this evening and we thank you uh, for joining us tonight. Before we get started, I want to talk a bit about some of the uh, ground rules and how the evening is going to go. It is the second virtual community discussion that the police department has held in an effort to continue dialogue with citizens about the progress the department has recently made. Now, this evening's format will include discussions between panelists led by Chief Steve Hebby. Panelists will be responding to questions from audience members at the end of their discussion. So if you have a question, we invite you to write it into the comment section of the live feed and it will be passed on to us here. We'd also like to remind everyone that the city of Farmington is a civility first community. So please be respectful of one another in the comments. So thank you again for joining us and it's my great pleasure to introduce Farmington Police Chief Steve Heavy. Thank you, Scott. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we're sorry that we're doing this virtually. Uh, we had intended to be down at the Civic Center and that we were gonna have a live audience, uh, but circumstances have changed. Uh, a little bit with the public health order. So we wound up doing the next best thing, which is virtual. We look forward to doing these uh, in person in the future. But for tonight, uh, what you've got with me is uh, my Deputy Chief Taft Tracy and my Captains Dowdy and Bear Crumb. And uh, we'll go around the room. We'll give a brief little introduction of ourselves. I started policing in December of 1990. Uh, so I've been doing it now for almost 31 years. I've seen lots of changes uh, over those 31 years and some of them have been good changes and some of them have been uh, not as good changes. Uh, I've been the chief here since March of 2014, so about seven and a half years uh, that I've been your chief of police. We've done lots of things uh, through the years to try and keep our department kind of on the cutting edge of what we see nationally going on in policing. That's always a challenge for us, uh, but we've, we've worked hard to do that and tonight we're gonna talk about some of the things that came out of this recent legislative session and then some of the things that we're doing here at the department. Uh, Deputy Chief Tracy. Thanks, Chief. Uh, like the Chief said, I have uh, taken on the rank of Deputy Chief. Um, again, my name is Taft Tracy. I have been with the Farmington Police Department for a little over 22 years now. I've held all the ranks that the Farmington Police Department has had to offer except for Chief of Police, and I'll be glad to take that. No, I'm just kidding, <laughs> Chief. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad we've got this recorded, folks, yeah, yeah, just um, in case anything happens to me on the drive home, but go ahead. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> the, the deputy chief position allows me to, to deal with a lot of the operational things within the department. I deal a lot with uh, personnel issues and things like that, with the union, in discussions with them. Um, I also work closely with other entities within the city and in the county to, to handle um, things that will affect the Farmington Police Department. And I do those in lieu of the chief because he's a busy man and he can't handle all of all of that stuff by himself. So uh, he tasked me with a bunch of those things. And now I'll pass it on to Captain Crum. Well, it's great to be in a second opportunity this evening. I'm Barrett Crum. I currently serve as the operations captain for the Farmington Police Department. I've been serving and a part of FPD since 2002. I've been privileged to work with Chief Heavy now for almost six years on a, a command level in the administrative function as a lieutenant and now as a captain for just over four years. Uh, as the operations captain, I currently have opportunities to serve and provide insight and direction in our patrol division and in our investigations divisions, the two largest divisions in the police department that is broken down into several units of different focuses, whether it's our impact team, SROs, or <clears throat> other specialized teams that we provide services to the city for. I'll pass it on to Kyle Dowdy. Uh, I'm Captain Kyle Dowdy, and in December of 1990, I was halfway through my third grade year in school. <laughs> um, I've been with the police department since uh, 2004. I'm the captain over uh, what we call administrative services, so uh, internal affairs and um, just things of that nature. Um, that's about it. Happy to be here. Thank you very much, everybody. Chief, we'll have you start the conversation with uh, the panel here on some of the topics that uh, I think are of interest of the community. We'll remind folks, if you have a question, we'll get to those at the end of the panel discussion, so please write them down in the comment box 
on the uh, on the live feed of the video on Facebook Live. And we do have some comments that have come in already, um, some focused on traffic, and, and we will get to some of those uh, later on. Some of the topics that we want to hit on tonight, uh, obviously COVID and what the police department's been doing over the last year and a half, and, and now in particular with the second uh, iteration of it. Uh, what, what are we doing to enforce the public health order? What does that look like? Uh, and how does that impact the, the police department uh, in our daily operations? Uh, we'll talk some on that. We'll talk about our real-time crime center, which we just recently announced, uh, but we've had growing uh, since February uh, with the first six cameras and, and now a real significant expansion uh, that Captain Crumb's been working on and how that has changed the way that, that our officers are doing business. And then we'll talk about some other topics like the new marijuana legislation uh, and then HB4, which is the, the civil rights uh, legislation that was passed uh, that allows for more lawsuits against police officers, the qualified immunity bill. We, we thought we'd hit on some of those topics. Uh, most of them we have not had a chance to, to discuss with you in detail. And we'll kick off with, uh, Cap, uh, with Deputy Chief Tracy. He's been dealing with the COVID topic for us, uh, kind of been our point man uh, in dealing with the city response to it and, uh, and give you the, the latest information that we have on, on what honestly is a, still a, a very significant problem uh, that, that is costing people their lives. Thanks, Chief. You know, um, I think everybody in the community and across the country and around the world has been working to deal with this particular issue that came up in, in the beginning of 2020 where we were, you know, exposed to a virus that um, was new to everything and everyone and, and, and it's had a, an extremely uh, bad effect on our, our, our own communities, but uh, you know, on the nation as a whole, we've seen a lot of uh, illness and a lot of death from it. Um, I think the, the news out there just said that we have now surpassed the number of deaths that were associated with the Spanish flu, um, which occurred in 1918. And now, you know, COVID has suppressed that as far as the number of people that have died just within uh, the United States. And unfortunately, our community and our state has suffered a, a number of losses related to COVID. Um, this last December, the COVID vaccines started to come out and um, many of the people uh, that were first made available, that the vaccine was first made available to were the elderly and those with immune uh, compromised immuno compromised, compromised yeah. immunities. Sure. I can't say Words that word today for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. But anyway, um, they were the first to be able to to get the vaccine. But since then, uh, anybody over the age of 12 has been allowed to get the vaccine. And so we've seen our numbers here in San Juan County go above 50 percent of fully vaccinated individuals, which is really good if you consider uh, the the totality of that with young kids and everything. Uh, 12 and up being in, in those numbers. So really 50% is good. We would love to be a lot better than that. Um, so I encourage people to go ahead and go out and get, get vaccinated. And I'll provide you all with some of that information on where you can go, who you can contact to, to get tested for COVID and to get vaccinated for COVID if you're interested. Um, so to talk a little bit about the, the COVID response from our our agency, the Farmington Police Department, and, and the mandates that come out through the public health order. You know, the chief had, had talked about that being something that we deal with. And, and fortunately for us here in, in San Juan County, we have a, a pretty good community. I've, I've been out in the community, out of uniform, in uniform, and I've, I've noticed as the mandates are in place, people are following the mandates for the most part. Now we do have occasional situations where we have to remind our community members to, to mask up when they're needing to mask up. And uh, for generally speaking, we have good compliance from that. We haven't had to take any aggressive enforcement action against our community members um, related to that. And if we did, uh, you know, if there, we did have a problem, we would, we would take the necessary enforcement action um, as, as dictated by law. You but know, for the most part, we've been We've been able to get by with education, and, and that really goes back to the first iteration of the public health order. We did a lot of educating. We passed out masks. Yep. We did things like that. We haven't, we haven't had to do nearly as much this time around. People really are wearing the masks. Uh, we're, we, I don't even know if we've been handing many out. Uh, we, we have them available. We but do I don't have think them we've available. To. 
We so haven't had good. to, you know, and, and, and Chief, you're right, we've, we've seen a lot of com compliance. And in a community that cares, compare, cares for each other, and we, didn't, we haven't had to have a lot of uh, serious conversations with community members about it. Now, the, man, the current mandates are that when you are indoors, um, you need to be wearing a mask. Uh, and they ask that you do that anytime you're in close proximity with others and unable to safe, keep safe distances of uh, six feet or more. And if you're going to be within a, that proximity for more than 15 minutes. When you're outside your workspace, uh, when you're in your workspace, you're, you're good to go. Yes. But when you're outside your workspace, so we're, you know, our officers wear them when we're walking around the department. Um, but when you go outside right now, you do not have to have a mask. You don't. And now, obviously, everybody has a choice and if they want to wear their mask out while they're walking or in a park or anything like that they absolutely can and that's okay but it's also okay for those that are out in the community outside to not wear a mask and we ask that people recognize that as their as their choice um, but I, I would like to reiterate the importance of if you feel sick you should probably go get tested so that if you are in fact positive you're not infecting others and for information on where to get tested, I'll give you some of that right now. The, uh, the best place to go is out at McGee Park where they have the curative testing taking place. Now you can set up an appointment to go get tested out at McGee Park by going online or calling a phone number. And I'm gonna give you that, that phone number now to set up an appointment to get testing, a curative test out at McGee Park. You would call one 888 Eight seven zero two nine zero four two, and at that number you can make arrangements to get a test out at McGee Park. They do that Monday through Friday from eight to three, um, and if you want to, you can also go online and log in and uh, and schedule a test, and that is at curative.com forward slash sites forward slash two four one eight zero, and by doing that. Uh, by, by going online like that, they can get you right in right away at your scheduled appointment time, get your tests, and within 48 hours, you'll usually have your test results. Uh, again, it's a, it's a nasal swab. It's a, it's a shallow nasal swab. You all have images in your head of the previous test, which was quite a deep test, a deep nasal swab, and that has changed to a shallow nasal swab now, and they can get you uh, the test results um, pretty quickly from that. Now, if you are interested in getting the vaccine and um, want to schedule an appointment, you can. Uh, you can do that through the public health office. And the phone number for them is 327-4461. That, again, that's 505-327-4461. You can call them to schedule an appointment or you, many of the pharmacies here in town are providing vaccine. So you can call your local pharmacy and, and schedule it. I think there's a number of health providers here in town that are, are providing vaccine as well. So you can get that through your doctor's office. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that you have to get vaccinated or that you, 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 you shouldn't get vaccinated. I think it's important that you, um, you take the time to in, do your, your research, talk to your doctor and, and find out what they recommend you do for you. Um, try to keep off of the internet to get all of your information because it may not be the information that's going to lead you to the right decision. So talk to a medical professional, ask them what their thoughts are on it, and then make the right decision for you and your family. And that's pretty much all I have on that. Topic. Yeah, social media isn't always the best place to get your information uh, about serious topics. Uh, talk with your doctor. Uh, maybe the vaccine isn't for you. Uh, maybe you have health conditions that uh, preclude it, but uh, we really have done a pretty good job here in, in Farmington of, of getting the vaccine uh, to an acceptable level, which is, I think, helping tamp down uh, the spread of the, of the disease. We, and as far as being a department goes, uh, we have not had any, anyone die from it uh, at our agency, and that is, uh, that is actually shockingly good news. I do condolence cards. Uh, for officers and citizens uh, that pass away in our community. And uh, I have done literally dozens and dozens and dozens of officers across our country that are passing away uh, from COVID. Uh, so it is still a threat to, to the police. You'll see our officers in many circumstances, they're still gonna be wearing their gloves, they're still gonna be wearing their masks. 
uh, under circumstances where the, the chance of exposure is higher. But we've been lucky as an agency and our, our staff has stayed healthy uh, for the most part, although we have had some that have caught it. Uh, everybody has recovered uh, and that is not every department. So it is still a serious topic. Uh, it does impact our operations on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, but that's kind of the, the latest update on that. Uh, the next topic that I thought we'd swing into is uh, the Real-Time Crime Center. This one we, we announced uh, a few, uh, few months ago. It's actually, my vision of it is it, it'll change the way our police department operates. Ten years from now, you will, you will see us much more reliant on cameras to help us solve crimes. Uh, but that is starting slow as we're doing the build out of cameras around town. We're focusing on a couple of areas, the parks in particular, uh, the river walk downtown, and, and then streets, your, your main streets, uh, East Main, 20th. Things like racing on the streets, uh, which has been a problem in Farmington for uh, a generation or more. Uh, we, we believe within a few years we will be able to effectively deter that and, and hold the people accountable who are doing those things. Um, but the, the man who's been leading that operation for us uh, is Captain Crum. Uh, we've put together, I think we've got three employees in there, two sworn and one civilian, uh, and then a sergeant over the unit. And uh, they're, they're actually running it right now as we're, as we're speaking. And then we're also building out cameras and getting grant money uh, for, for an expanded uh, system. So some of what we wanted to talk about is what are, what, what are we doing with this so that you, you understand what we're doing, and then what are some of the things that we're not doing with this. So, Barrick, you've, you've been working on it hard now for uh, almost a year. We have. I, I guess I first should probably give a little background on how we ended up here. We acquired a Homeland Security grant initially after we had placed six cameras at specific locations in our parks. We saw the benefit of it. We acquired the Homeland Security Grant, and from there we've expanded to right now, as of today, today we sit at about 126 cameras across the city at specific locations in our parks and also at intersections. And we've we finished that Homeland Security Grant phase, then we moved into another phase where we grew the system even more and we're kind of on a pause now for the next few weeks we hope that we can start phase three where we'll probably push towards about 280 total cameras by the time phase three gets done and we'll have created a web of of systems that will help us in many different ways and we're already seeing the benefits of it and tonight i want to share a few of those with you one of them is a recent one where we know COVID has had its effects on people and putting people in crisis. Last year we saw our suicide rate go up and we see it even amongst our youth. And here recently we had a juvenile from a specific uh, middle school flee the, the middle school in crisis and they notified us that this juvenile was more likely than not a threat to himself and as police, we're not able to always be right there when, when a crisis occurs. But fortunately, we have tried to strategically place cameras at intersections or city-owned properties to provide us opportunities to get us to locations before the officer can even navigate through the streets and roadways, through traffic and other inhibitors that might delay their response. We utilized a camera that can see to this particular middle school. We watched the juvenile leave the property, move off of property into kind of a, a wooded area, and were able to show officers and tell officers where to go specifically to respond to this particular juvenile so that they could hopefully stop the crisis from going to what we all want to avoid and that's suicide and in this case we were able to stop this juvenile in crisis and and get them help that they desperately needed and provide them with the resources to help them deal with the problems that they're dealing with you know for us that that's a different type of win but nonetheless it's a win for us when we can save life in that manner versus other manners and that, and that student was actively in the process of, they were. of, of carrying out uh, the, the initial planning for, for a suicide. 
Uh, if we had arrived a half hour later, which probably would have been optimistic, if we hadn't had cameras watching them, you know, it, it, the act easily could have been completed. So in this case, we really were able to intervene in a suicide that was in progress. We were, and, and you know, that's the power and what we envisioned partially on, on what we s see this camera system doing. You know, we just had another one this weekend where, again, we're not always able to be where we need to be and where we want or where, we'd, where we would like to be for certain situations. And we had a, a vehicle stolen from a business during daylight hours and our camera system picked up uh, this particular vehicle and followed it from the business to another business where the individual at this point decides he's going to abandon the vehicle he stole but we keep eyes on him through our camera system and lead officers to his the area where he's walking in the parking lot and they take him into custody we arrest him for DWI and for stealing a vehicle you know these are, are just a few uh, of the things that we see happening in many different areas of the system. Uh, there are other areas where we've been able to mitigate those confrontations when a traffic crash occurs of who's really got the green light, who had the red light. You know, we've been able to dispel those types of concerns by playback uh, and finding out who actually had the green light. And so, you know, some of those are more minor, but nonetheless, they, they prove beneficial in, in abating those heated moments when two individuals are, you know, looking at each other in, in spite because one of us was wrong, but it wasn't me kind of deal. And then we're able to get on the radio and find out who actually was right and who was wrong and, and make a, a more informed choice and our officers are doing a better and better job of, of utilizing that real-time out in the field. Uh, so when they're responding to crashes, they know that the real-time crime center is now up and that they, we've got the ability to spool back and, and see what happened at that intersection. And, and we've been using it for things like that. And we also used it pretty successfully in the recent uh, Brookside Park initiative that we had where we had lots of officers out in the park trying to reestablish control of, of what was going on there. We'd received a number of complaints. And then we were up on 20th Street as well, and, and the camera system was working hand-in-hand -hand with our officers. Yes, and just to spin off of that one, literally, <laughs> you know, we coordinated with state police here a few months back, and we've always tried to abate racing wherever it is in the city of Farmington. And now that we have a pretty good web of cameras down 20th Street, which is where we've had problems with racing and have had you know, vehicular homicides occur due to racing in that corridor. We've been able to actually catch people in racing mode and take enforcement action, you know. And so the cameras can go from the park to the intersections, to the roadway, to other locations as necessary. You know, when it comes to the system, we're always mindful of the rights of the people and, and what is prudent and necessary for us to be viewing you know, we can't view every camera, and so our operators are sitting there listening to what's going on on the radio while they're researching out other past incidents and doing investigative work on, on other cases. They may go to specific cameras and start helping those officers in real time to provide them the information they need to be more effective in their response, the information they need to know as far as the details of vehicles, the details of you know how a person may be dressed you know and so forth and so those four operators within that RTCC are definitely providing officers with valuable information in their ability to take care of cases in a way that we've never been able to do in times past uh, as, as we look to the future you know we want the community to know that we are mindful of the way that we conduct business and that we are mindful of our constitutional obligations and that we are mindful of your constitutional freedoms and what that means for us and what that means for you and how we navigate that in a judicious manner is important and we are striving to do what we know we have the authority to do 
and do it in, in the best way we can to solve crimes, to provide everybody with the response they, they deserve and want from us as their police department. So, you know, the, the one of the questions that came up was about uh, facial recognition technology. And, and believe me, I understand people's concern about cameras and government intrusion and Big Brother. Uh, you know, I, I, um, I reiterate what Captain Crum's saying. That is one of our highest priorities is, is protecting people's constitutional rights. That's our job. Uh, so we, we are not going to do things that are going to infringe on that. These cameras are in public places. Uh, so when we have robberies, when we have burglaries, when we have drunk drivers, when we have uh, stolen vehicles, uh, when we have attacks going on in the parks, uh, we're going to be there and we're going to have the evidence and we're going to uh, we're going to prevent crime when we can. But we do not utilize facial recognition technology and we have no plans to use it. Uh, that kind of started on the internet again. Uh, maybe the internet isn't always the best place uh, to get your information. Although I guess right now we're on the internet, so uh, you know I'll, I'll have to temper that a little bit. This is the best place to get it on the internet. Uh, but we do not use facial recognition technology, and nor do we plan to. Uh, but we do plan to have a, a robust camera system that's monitored. Ideally, you'd be monitoring it 24 hours a day. We're not able to do that right now uh, to assist officers in arriving at scene safely. Uh, when, we're, when we're getting officers in dynamic circumstances, uh, like we had the gentleman that was walking around the downtown area here a couple of months back and was firing a gun off, uh, fired 20-some rounds in, in various places around the downtown area. Right now what we have is officers going physically to look and, and hopefully find, in this case it took a couple of hours before we were able to find them. That's a long time when somebody's actively shooting. Um, so our camera system would give us the ability to do something faster and to vector officers in there in, in a safer manner, giving the officers more information about who they're looking for, what the suspect looks like, what he's wearing. Uh, as it was, our officers did not know exactly uh, who they were approaching, and there was uh, several people sitting together when they first pulled up. Uh, that, that's a bad spot for the officers, and, and uh, we don't want to see an officer getting killed under those circumstances. So we're, we're high on the, on the system, we're high on the potential for it, uh, but we are not utilizing things like facial recognition. And no. just to, to clarify from, from maybe another point of view, it's not all just cameras, it's information, right? So the Real-Time Crime Center is, is working with uh, information avenues, whether it be the internet or Facebook or whatever accounts that are out there that people have, to gather information on individuals that maybe we're going to a call on and they can provide that information to the, the responding officers in a timely fashion so that the officers may have a better understanding of who they're dealing with before they get there so they have a better plan when they get there that kind of thing uh, captain crumb i'll let you expand on that so you know initially we probably were focused more on the cameras and as time has gone on we see the value in what many agencies develop usually with not only themselves but with other agencies is called a fusion center and they use different platforms different software mechanisms and other agencies to bring in intelligence to their agency so that they can provide more information to officers in a in a quicker more deliberate response as they are responding to a scene they can go into these databases that are filled with information about particular people as they have been involved in past crimes and make officers aware of these individuals past habits and past crimes and what they may be going up against and so that fusion RTCC aspect is definitely one that we've taken on we are providing information not only to our officers by some of these platforms that we've partnered up with Rocky Mountain Information Network and, and also internally we are providing information to the Four Corners region and not just on the New Mexico side but Arizona, Utah and Colorado and that intelligence is empowering every agency to help them in solving their particular investigations so that they can bring a resolution to the victims and hopefully provide what every victim wants and that's peace of mind and knowing that we've come to hopefully that ideal conclusion. So the parks in particular is a real jewel for us here in Farmington, uh, but it's, it's a challenge for the police. Uh, you know, and we're driving around in cars, we're responding to calls, uh, and so we're not generally just walking through the park and the park system is expanding bigger and bigger 
you still want to feel safe while you're down there and in, in all the nooks and crannies of that and explore it. It is a great part of Farmington. Uh, but that has been a challenge for us. We have our park ranger unit deployed down there. We have our bike officers down there some. Um, but the cameras give us the ability to, to be everywhere, if you will, uh, and to make sure that people are safe when they're in the park. And if something does happen, to figure out what happened quickly and, and then go after solving that case. Uh, so that, that to, to us is, is key, although we're on the roads and we, and we are doing some of that. Uh, we're in the parks a lot and, and we're, uh, you know, we're cognizant of how important the parks are, in particular the Riverwalk, uh, to Farmington. That's why this, the city's expanding it as, as much as they are with dreams of going all the way out to Aztec. I think right now we're, we're planning on having that safety and security element being part of it. Uh, and that even goes uh, towards Farmington Lake, which is a, a huge kind of a surprise for us. Uh, that's come up over the last few years. Um, the, the lake, if you remember, four or five years ago, uh, we couldn't even swim in it. Now it's, it's really being developed. Again, that's a challenge for the police. Uh, we're a long way from Farmington Lake. We don't have uh, resources that are out there on a regular basis. Uh, but with the cameras and the camera systems that we're going to be employing out there, as the lake expands, uh, we'll still be able to provide safety and security for you and your family while you're out there. You know, the park aspect is an interesting one. You know, having worked for FPD for 19 years and gone to many other cities, I don't know that you'll find another area with this amount of density of parks. And so we definitely find ourselves in the parks a lot, and we've definitely done our due diligence in, in bringing about the, the park ranger unit and having them be in these parks and also our animal control officers and officers in general. and as we continue to expand that river walk, it makes it even harder to find the resources to be everywhere. You know, and when somebody's a victim, even if we hope not in the park, but that does happen, we want the opportunity to solve that crime. And sometimes the cameras won't catch the actual crime, but maybe they catch that particular suspect. And then that gives us the opportunity to move forward to solving that particular incident and that just helps us, again, help that victim know where we want to go when it comes to helping them. And they feel that we are doing our, our best by, in a, in a more technological way, but nonetheless a way that helps them. And so as we look towards the expansion of the Riverwalk here these next few months, and the western corridor we're going to put more cameras there and as it goes east we will consider putting cameras there you know chief mentioned farmington lake yes we're set to put a few cameras out at farmington lake because again even though you're there we know that sometimes crime does happen and, and sometimes we aren't there and so we want to be able to afford everybody that opportunity as best as we can to have their particular crime solved and this is just augmenting that in so many different ways. So I'll probably kick it back to Scott right now uh, who's eagerly waiting to, to join in the discussion. I, I am. But so, we, so am I. I, I, I know it. I think we've got some questions that are really in so Nicole and Georgette are eager to dive in. And, right. Uh, so we've gotten a few that have come in okay. and uh, even prior to, uh, to tonight but the first one deals with traffic. Okay. And this, this answer may save a marriage, everyone, <laughs> so be careful how you okay. answer this. But the question is, is it legal or illegal to change lanes in an intersection? Um, the writer says he was told by an officer in high school 28 years ago that it's legal, but things change, and he has a disagreement with his wife. And so can we save the marriage and answer this question? Once again, I, I resent the, the years being brought in. Uh, you know, right. I, I had right. to what take it from Dowdy when he was in third. <laughs> what grade were you ago. when I started being was, a police chief? 10. Uh, you know, yeah, I, I, I so can't say I, wasn't I appreciate driving, it. So I, I won't answer this because I wasn't able to. Okay. Well, back thank back. you. But maybe <laughs> I'll Taft defer. All right. Well, you and know, chief? I think there's some misunderstanding out there a little bit about what is allowed and what's not allowed, I guess. People need to understand that you can't change lanes in an intersection unless it's safe to do so. And that's really rare. the the, uh, the guideline. If it's not safe to do so, you shouldn't do it whether you enter an intersection or not. So uh, the, currently the, the, the law states that you can't change intersections or change lanes in an intersection unless it's safe to do so. So by that, it would be the, the judgment of the officer or whoever was in, in the vicinity that if they have witnessed you change a lane, and it affected traffic in that intersection, 
meaning you cut someone off or something like that, then it would be considered unsafe, and you would find yourself getting cited for that. So it's a bit of a yes or no. Both sides are right. Wow. Both sides are right. So, so, so everybody gets really like. safe. Okay. Having been married yeah. for 27 plus years, I would say that that's a safe answer. There okay. you go. All right. <laughs> Stick with the safe answer. Very good. And could it be different in other states? It is. Yes, it, absolutely. Right? A lot of traffic laws are different in other states. And okay. I think that people uh, run into those problems when they travel. They may end up in a, in a city where it's not legal to do something they can do in the state they came from. Right. And sure. I think, you know, I, I can talk about stories from other people that I've heard where they've made decisions maybe to turn right at a, at a red light in another state. Uh, they have a right to do that here in the state of New Mexico as long as you come to a complete stop and it's safe to do so. Well, some states you can't do that. No, no right turns on red, that kind of stuff. So there are different laws in, in the states, uh, different states, and that people should be aware of that. Okay. Thank you all very much. Next question, too, relates to traffic, which is about a speed trailer for neighborhoods. How can, how can some folks in a neighborhood get a speed trailer and uh, maybe stop uh, speeders zooming up and down the street? Sure. These are, these are popular, and, and we do deploy them around town. We have speed trailers available. Uh, we do strategically place them based on uh, concerns that we have as an agency as far as speeding and, and other issues in, in a neighborhood. Or if we get complaints from a neighborhood, they, they, then we'll put that particular speed trailer in that area to kind of get some information and also to forewarn individuals that, hey, this is the speed. And a lot of people forget. You know, they're driving down the road and they're used to driving 30 miles an hour. Well, the speed limit's not 25. And so we, that flashing red reminds them, oh, wait, I'm going too fast. And it helps them slow down and reminds them of the, of the speed. It's kind of like a school zone. When you see that trailer or you see the school zone flashing, you see, oh yeah, I'm reminded I need to slow down to 15 miles an hour. Um, so that's what we utilize the speed trailers for. And then we also utilize the traffic engineering department here in, in the city to go ahead and gather data to get volume of traffic, average speeds of traffic, and then we can make decisions based on that whether or not we're going to allocate additional resources for enforcement efforts in that particular location. One easy way, though, is to to just message on Facebook, message the department. Our PIO, uh, Nicole Brown, you know, monitors that and she'll route the information to us and we'll see who's, you know, who's been complaining the most about it. And then we deploy our trailers uh, oftentimes based on that as well. And sometimes we've, we've had a wreck or something in, in a certain area and, and that is kind of what guides us. But if you're interested in having a speed trailer in your area, get hold of us through Facebook Messenger and, and we'll take that in we'll take a look at it. It's that simple. It's that simple to do that. Okay, very good. Let me uh, go back to Captain Crum for a minute about the real-time crime center that we were talking about just a few minutes ago. And I know a lot of folks get concerned about privacy and things like that. And I know you made it very clear that all these cameras that you're using are on public property, and that's a big distinction, is it not? Because I think, and I'm not a lawyer, even though sometimes I dress like one, <laughs> but um, when people are in public, they really have no expectation of privacy. Isn't that kind of the way the law reads? The, you know. Let me utilize that question to kind of show some other aspects that we are involved in. We look to partner with businesses that have cameras. And so, you know, most people should already realize if you're in Walmart, you're already on video from the moment you drive on the property. And then when you walk in, you're on video 24 seven throughout their entire store. And, and that's the case with a lot of, you know, retail vendors and it's also the case in our schools, there are camera systems. It's the case for a lot of other uh, private businesses as well. And so we look to partner with them and we also partner with other departments in the city that have cameras at their specific locations, whether it's our museums or library, so that we can provide the best response to that business. And so, uh, you know, that's kind of the long answer to you, you. Your expectation as you go on to a particular business's private property is already compromised by you wanting to do business with them. You are under their purview as far as what they want to have happen on their property. If they want to put cameras on their property, that's their prerogative. Then you're under the scope of their particular camera system. And so uh, it'd be gotcha. the same with a lot of other places. It's still a public place, right? And so that's right. maybe the difference, is it not? Yes. Now, if yes. I have a camera on my front porch, and there's been, I think, some reports in the media about companies that rhyme with thing, 
uh, maybe <laughs> making their video available to law enforcement. Would that be something that you would look into as well to expand that oh. network, as you mentioned, that are facing the street? So maybe you could record a, a crime or the aftermath. You know, utilization of, of camera systems by the individual homeowner, we would encourage that, you know, because we've seen over the last year and a half where officers have been, you know, assaulted by perpetrators on other people's property, but the ring doorbell on somebody else's property is capturing the event and showing kind of the dynamics of the situation. And so, you know, the value in that and showing what transpires as a, an incident unfolds is invaluable when those officers are are later on in court and showing the jury what transpired in this particular incident. And so, you know, we can't necessarily dictate to the homeowner, hey, you must make it face this way. But, you know, most of those ring doorbells are probably going to face towards the street. And, you know, if they want to coordinate with us, we are more than happy to know that they have a ring doorbell or they have a, a camera system. and. That way, if an incident or a burglary or, or something else transpires in their particular neighborhood, we know that they have it. We could reach out to them and, and find out if they have a vehicle that passed by in the time frame that, that the burglary happened. And so we're able to do a lot of different things through that type of coordination. If homeowners are willing to share, you know, we're going to come and, and see if the video can provide us with that additional information. And we yeah. have had a couple of partnerships with businesses in town. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that we will look to expand. If you're a business and, and you, you want to work with, with the PD under certain circumstances that, that our officers could get in, and obviously one of them would be in the middle of a robbery or, or uh, in, in the middle of schools. You know, we tap into the schools uh, when, when there is an incident in there so that we can alert officers what's going on. Um, th those are definite tools that, that help us. Uh, as far as private citizens, I think eventually, I don't know if we're, if we're rucked up really right now to start taking on every individual across the, the city that would want to. But I know that some departments uh, have established those partnerships with citizens. And one department, I think, was even uh, giving out grants uh, so that citizens would get cameras and that the department would help pay for the cost of the camera. And then under certain circumstances, the police could have access to it. Uh, so we, we definitely do canvas the area after a crime to see who's got cameras and who, who maybe has some footage. And we have solved crimes that way. We have. You know, we, we saw when we were first doing research that Albuquerque Police Department coordinated and developed an MOU with Lauterberger. You know, so they were seeing crime at sometimes occasionally at Lauterberger and it helped them in the future when incidents did occur that they already had that MOU in place to help them solve those types of crimes. And, and we've definitely done some similar things with reaching out to businesses and developing that understanding of what our purpose is and when we would access you know cameras from their particular business sure and that footage I would imagine you're recording even from the city owned cameras a lot of footage that then you have to store somewhere for a certain period of time and then I would assume at some point it gets reused or erased or so that's another good that, right? that's another good question you know, our cameras are running 24-7, and when you think about the amount of volume there, it, it adds up very quickly. So we developed a policy, and we have aligned it kind of similar with what we'd researched out. We only retain video for seven days. We don't have the capacity or the server space to keep the video for the, the length of time. Any above and beyond that, we just would break ourselves by trying to buy more servers and retain it for that period. So our officers know if there's an incident you need video for, you better get a hold of the operators, get it recorded to the DVD or the Blu-ray so that you have it for your case because in seven days it's going to fall off the server and be deleted. It's a good thing we have cameras here tonight uh, because honestly the alarm's been going off for the last five minutes. And <laughs> I'm starting to get a little worried. I don't know if you've heard that. We've been a little nervous. Uh, you know, we're actually going to reach out to the show. The show must go on, you know, but that doesn't mean we're not scared, Scott. So, you know. <laughs> well, what does that mean? Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me ask another question from, uh, from uh, Facebook. 
and uh, social media, and this can be to, to any of you. So uh, let's let's try Kyle. Let's do it. I'm warmed up on that. Right. Why don't we start with like, you? And like that is, jump um, what <coughs> motivates you to get up to go to work every day? Oh, you know, uh, Mike Graff in the recruiting video. You saw our recent recruiting video. Uh, he says, you know, I get motivated to get up and go to work every day because of the place I work. Uh, so you know, Farmington's a great city. Farmington Police Department's a fantastic police department. Um, there's a uh, a lot of nationwide, um, maybe differing opinions on what police officers should be doing. And we just, we really haven't faced that locally. We've, we've been lucky to be surrounded by supportive people, supportive businesses, uh, the community is supportive. And so I really don't have anything negative to say about where I work or, or who I work for or, or the community I serve. So the motivation, I guess, comes from just the support that is, uh, that is shown every day to us uh, doing our job. That's important. It's very important. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult because you've got police officers that are leaving other cities because they're not supported by the community. And they feel like, you know, at any moment, you know, any minor mistake they may do, they may be, you know, facing serious backlash. And, and we understand the repercussions of, you know, us making decisions that, you know, aren't up to par. But there's also that, you know, we're not afraid that our community is going to turn on us for nothing at a given moment. We feel supported because I think they understand with the transparency, you know, we've always been striving for is, if we make a mistake, we're going to own it, and we're going to tell you we made a mistake, and we're going to come out and we're going to do you know, whatever we can to correct that mistake. And that hopefully puts a little bit of ease in the mind of our citizens of, hey, these guys aren't trying to cover anything up. If, if, if something goes wrong, maybe we can't you know, disclose it all right away, but as soon as they're able to, they're going to tell us what happened and what went wrong, and we're going to release the video, we're going to release the body camera, and we're going to make them, or we're going to let them make their own independent decisions on on how they think we did as an agency. And then we're gonna listen to their feedback. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna take it in. We're gonna try to make ourselves better. We're, we're improving ourselves every day. And a lot of that just goes to, uh, to show the, the, the bond we have with a police department and the community and the collaboration that we do you know, every day. Because honestly, we get our authority from the people. And, and if we don't have the people's support, the police don't have any authority. Is that, is that good enough? I think that, that's right, a good that answer. But you, you, you're blowing through a, a nice one, and that's our recruitment okay. video, which is available on our Facebook page. Yeah, so I just, so yeah. if you're watching us on Facebook Live, and then as soon as you're done, then just scroll down a little bit, and, and there's our recruitment video. And, and we worked with uh, Zia Media, a local company, to put that together. And, and Kyle, you did a lot of work on that with your training staff. Do uh, you, you mind if I talk about that now? So yeah, yeah. yeah so recruiting has um, recruiting been difficult nationwide, not just for us. Uh, so Lieutenant Nate Lacey and his group of recruiters decided that they were going to do a little bit extra, kind of take us from the analog age to the digi digital age, because, you know, uh, pre-pandemic, going to job fairs was nice, having billboards was good, uh, but really some of that face-to-face -face interaction kind of came to a screeching halt, and we had to make a decision, okay, how are we going to recruit? Well, first of all, how are we going to recruit a newer generation of police officers? Because uh, some of my esteemed colleagues who are up there in years, you know, we can't recruit them anymore. They're, they're kind of past their expiration date. So we're going for the younger group. But we're still here. But you're still here. <laughs> and you still sign my check. So uh, yes. we're, we're going for the, you know, a younger group and what's going to be appealing to them. Um, what was appealing to me and what got me to be a police officer may be completely different than what um, the next generation is looking for. Uh, so, you know, we had to do some research and we had to do a lot of, you know, development of us as, as an agency of, okay, what type of person are we trying to recruit um, to be a police officer in Farmington? What type of agency are we at our core that we can kind of you know, manifest those same um, core values to people and, and draw them in? And, and part of this was, was the recruiting video that I think Zia Media just knocked out of the park, really, really hit on what we were trying to, to hit onto, really focused on the same uh, character qualities that we were also trying to uh, recruiting people um, and in the end it was a fantastic product uh, it took a lot of work a lot of time a lot of effort on multiple people's uh, parts but in the end what it what what the chief's been saying for months now is you know the time is now the time is now to protect your community the time is now to um, help us in, improve ourselves so anybody can just sit back and and kind of you know nitpick what we're doing but to come and be part of the solution and come help us and, and get better and it, you know, some people may have questions about the diversity of our agency. Okay, well, we want to be as diverse as possible. We want to mirror our community, um, and we're looking to recruit anybody, and we're not going to um, really have uh, some sort of established quota of we need this many people of this diversity. We just want good people to be police officers in Farmington, uh, and, and we're, slowly, we're slowly getting there. 
we still need our help. Um, you know, tag somebody in this post if you, if you know somebody who would be a good cop for Farming Police Department. I'm sure this is reaching millions of v viewers. What are we at now, George? At two, two million viewers? Is that what we're at now? Close? Yeah. So this is going nationwide. This is blowing up. So, you know, maybe you're sitting in New York City watching this and you want to be a police officer in Farmington, New Mexico. We're excited to have you. Uh, so just reach out to your friends and family because the community is our best recruiters. We can only do so much to go out and say, hey, we're a great police department. Work for us. But it's those people with personal stories like they can tell family members and friends that actually department is that department is pretty good. You know, I had this issue and they solved it this way. It actually seems like a decent place to work. So please help us uh, recruit good people to work in your community with us. And definitely now is the time. So when you when you look back over history and and I know you were in the in the military and served a couple of tours uh, in combat. You know, that's the time that people step up, right? I mean, after Pearl Harbor, people volunteered. After 9-11, people volunteered. Well, really, the last couple of years have been very hard on police. Uh, we've been under intense criticism and scrutiny across the country and in every department. So even though we haven't seen some of the same issues uh, that have been the subject of so much uh, consternation across the country, still, our department's under a lot of scrutiny. Now is the time though just like just like after 9-11 now is the time that we need people to step up and help our profession to join up with us and let's make this thing better let's do a better job going forward let's regain the community's trust across the board so we do we don't need a hundred but we need 15 uh, good solid men or women uh, that that care about their community and want to make a difference and can stand up to criticism and can stand up to scrutiny and live with it live with the fact that we're gonna make mistakes sometimes we're gonna own those mistakes and then we're gonna move on so, you know, I, I'm only half kidding about s scrolling down and taking a look at that recruiting video. It is a great video. It's worth watching just, you know, any old time, gather the family around some popcorn. But it's also worth getting it out and let's find some people that, that actually want to be good police officers and, and want to serve on a good department. And, and maybe you're asking yourself, you know, do I, did I wake up this morning wanting to go to work? And, you know, the question you asked me, I'm not, I'm not lying about that. I really enjoy what I do. And, and a lot of people maybe don't you know, enjoy what they're doing right now for various different reasons. But, uh, you know, we wake up, the majority of us as police officers wake up and just appreciate um, the service we're able to provide to people on a daily basis. Nicole, did you have a question? Oh, is that, is that his job? You have three questions. Three questions. Okay. Three questions that come All right. Nicole Brown, public information <laughs> officer. Uh, so the first one. The disembodied voice. Is uh, <laughs> asking about how many uh, traffic accidents have happened with the traffic lights that have recently been taken out. It looks like they're really concerned with speeding vehicles on Apache, Dustin area. Which was where a light was that is no longer, so there's that yes. changeover. Actually, there was a couple lights taken off of Apache Street right. um, due to some uh, formulas and things that are done by the city in reference to traffic lights and the need for signals in certain areas and those particular areas didn't require a signal anymore based on those uh, reports and that data. Um, as far as uh, going back to the question, I don't remember the first part, I just know about the speeding. How many crashes have we had? Well, without, hard no without being able to pull up that data, I'm not going to be able to provide you exactly how many crashes we've had in that area or uh, any of the areas where they've recently removed any of those um, uh, traffic signals. We can get that data for them if they would like to message us privately on Facebook. We could get that information and provide it to them. Um, but we just had an operation down there in the on Butler, uh, mm -hmm. in the Dustin and Butler and Apache area. Because of that exact issue, a right. citizen was calling in to complain about uh, increased speeds because the lights were out. Um, I, I don't think that we have the data right now, and I'm not even really sure how relevant the data is right off the bat as far as crashes, because sometimes people are still learning uh, what, what the process is. So it's a, it's a new traffic configuration, uh, so sometimes people are just screwing that up, and then over time they'll, they'll settle down. We, we do agree and we're concerned that speeds are picking up in that area. Uh, we have had extra enforcement down there on a number of occasions, and we'll continue doing that. And then we'll work with the Traffic Enforcement Division to see, okay, if, if crashes are up, maybe we are going to have to uh, to put one of the lights back in at some certain location. Uh, so we're, we're flexible on that. The police don't make the decision on where the lights go. Uh, we, we are the ones that will enforce that. But we work with traffic engineering uh, when we see unsafe intersections. So and thank you for that question. And was right, when they took those it out? It was. I mean, right. they were flashing for a while, then they were then stop signs for a while, and yes. four-way stops for a while, I think. Or yep. That is correct. And, and we, you know, we did have a number of complaints and, and concerns from citizens during that particular transition. 
Uh, more recently, no, haven't had the same kind of complaints. The speeding complaints, yes, and we are addressing those um, in, in a number of areas in the city that are related to that very topic of, of removal of traffic signals. Nicole, we'll wait to hear from you again. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Okay, so this next one, um, I'll just read it as it is. Why is Farmington Police Department dealing with stray and loose animals instead of animal control? So for the most part, it is animal control that, that is doing that. Animal control is under, uh, under the police department. Uh, the, the shelter itself is under our Parks and Recreation Division within the city, but the, the actual enforcement officers, uh, and the, it was Parks and Animal Control officers, came over to FPD just before I arrived here. It was January of 2014. Uh, I think Barrick was actually their first sergeant as they came into the unit. Uh, so now they're, they're in uniforms. They have radios that can communicate with officers if they get into trouble. Uh, they're driving. Uh, they've got body armor. They've got tasers. So their safety's increased. Uh, they're also wearing body cameras so we can see what's going on with them, uh, same as any other officer. Uh, the police department does run uh, that part of it and our command structure, our supervisors uh, supervise what the, what the animal control officers do. But by and large, unless there's some extreme emergency, it is animal control officers that are going over and handling those. Isn't that correct, Barry? That is correct. You may see the one-off where an officer may be chasing the uh, potbelly pig. We did have an officer get injured chasing a you know, potbelly pig. It was actually a pretty big pig. It was a big potbelly pig. No cute little baby pig. For the most part, our animal control officers, since we've brought them on, we've been able to enhance the services that they provide to the city and to the citizens, you know. And so I think it's been beneficial to have them under FPD's wing and to enhance those services. Yeah. Maybe we should have Nicole actually come out here. People should actually see Nicole while she's asking these questions. So huh. the last question that I have right now in the comments is what strategies is FPD implementing to mitigate the missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic? And how are you working with the MMIW task force? Okay, that's a good question. Um, I'm actually on a, a part of that task force. I, the, the department was asked if we would have a person that would be willing to participate in that task force and the chief and I had discussed it, and, and I uh, have elected to be a part of that task force. And we meet uh, regularly, and, and we are putting together information and data um, to better um, address that issue. Uh, and it's not just missing and murdered women of an indigenous background, but also relatives. Uh, there's men and, and, and kids, um, people of alternative lifestyles uh, that fall within that same group. And they're preyed upon, and, and things happen to them, and and there's there's some shortfalls in how those particular investigations take place. A lot of it has to do with communication and data sharing uh, from from the tribal side to our side, um, and that's what we're trying to mitigate right now through that task force, and that is to come up with better ways of of tracking those individuals that go missing and working and coordinating with one another to to help find them and, and bring a resolution to their families because there are a number of, of individuals out there that have been missing for years and it has a, a, a huge impact on their communities and their family members and these individuals that are a part of this task force many of them have personal stories uh, related to that and so yeah we're partnering with with them on that task force to help identify ways that we can do a better job of, of dealing with those particular crimes and those particular situations where we have individuals that go missing we've also we've got a detective that's assigned mm -hmm. uh, to do nothing but follow up on missing person cases uh, our detectives it wasn't even just that one detective we had several detectives involved in the Cecilia Fenona case uh, which was a, a missing woman who uh, we feared had been murdered and then ultimately was found uh, to be murdered. That was just here uh, a month or two back uh, that her funeral uh, occurred. And, and that case had gone on for a couple of years and, and had really dogged her family and had dogged us. Uh, so we were pleased to be able to, to bring that to you know, some sort of resolution uh, to give them some closure as to what happened. But it's a tough case. Uh, and uh, oftentimes what departments face is multi-jurisdictional. 
Uh, so are they still in Farmington? Did they go out to uh, the, the nation? Did they go to Albuquerque? Uh, are, they, are they really safe and they just don't want to be contacted, uh, which happens too. Uh, so we spend a lot of time on missing person cases. We do have a lot of them. You see it on Facebook quite a bit here. Uh, I've even had questions, does it seem like it's, it's more than, than it used to be? I don't think that it's more than it used to be, but I think we're doing a lot more aggressive efforts to locate people early on. And that's actually Nicole uh, that, that runs the Facebook page and, and puts out the information and then we get your tips and, and we've tracked down many cases uh, and solved many cases much easier than we ever could have before. So, you know, we're, we're doing the best that we can on this topic, but uh, like Taft said, I think it's the governor's task force uh, that we sit on uh, as a department and we're, we're pleased to be part of it and we're hoping to improve communication, which I think is one of the biggest challenges. Can, I, can I add one table. thing on that? You know. As it relates to that particular area, one of the things that FPD is doing is, is utilizing more technology that is available to us to work not only with agencies within our state, but intra-agency across intra-states. You know, and you mentioned the Cecilia Fenona case. It went across four different states before we were able to bring that to a different resolution than what we we're hoping for, but nonetheless, we were working with a variety of different states and different agencies and even federal agencies to help us in, in that investigation. And, and technology is a, a factor in us helping a lot of those missing persons crimes. And actually in that case, you know, the, it was a Nevada police department that actually arrested the suspect. Uh, he was using her credit card uh, or ATM card, I guess. We'd been tracking his movements through that, uh, although obviously we were chasing behind it. Uh, but we were able to track him down into Nevada. We coordinated with the Nevada law enforcement. They made an arrest. We continued to coordinate with them on, on questioning the suspect. And on uh, he eventually served time in Nevada for the, uh, for the crime and was still in jail uh, for their charges when her remains were found and, and we were able to get him charged. So it was a lot of multi-jurisdictional uh, coordination. And I agree, you know, that technology is, uh, really was helping us. Thank you all very much, and thank you for the questions, uh, audience. There's still time. If you have a question, you can write it in the comment box on the, on the live feed. I do want to have you all address the issue of cannabis legislation that, of course, was passed in New Mexico. Uh, the city, I think, just dealt with some of it as soon as this week. They did. Um, and that leaves you all to enforce some of these things. And so how are, how are things looking, and uh, what do they mean for the department? So marijuana legalization occurred in New Mexico in a special session. Uh, it didn't pass in the initial uh, session that the governor called a special session. They met and it is legalized. Obviously it's, it's legal like alcohol. There's conditions on it. There's things you can't do with it. Um, but for the most part, recreational marijuana is, is now part of New Mexico. So the way our laws are, are enforced uh, and what we do here in Farmington is still being kind of worked out by the city council. Uh, but the the overarching part of it, you know, Captain Doughty's done some research on. We're looking at things like our canine program, uh, which Captain Doughty's been working on too. And so I'll, I'll let uh, you talk about it, Kyle. Okay, so uh, yeah, marijuana uh, in July became legal. Uh, there wasn't a ton of guidance from the state on how municipalities uh, should should deal with that, especially when it comes to the enforcement side of it. You're allowed to have two ounces of marijuana, uh, which is personal use. If you're a commercial grower, you're allowed up to like 4,500 plants. Uh, so there's a bunch of different rules and regulations from personal use all the way up to growing for commercial consumption. Uh, a big part of that is the water rights. Uh, there's a lot of discussion on, you know, how much water is going to go and needed to, to fund these cannabis farms. Uh, they're going to be coming to our state. Uh, we're, we're in the implementation stage of passing ordinances. Um, we're kind of trying to fill out, you know, what those ordinances are going to mean to the city, to the community. Um, the, the main thing that most people need to realize in Farmington is you have to be 21 years old to buy marijuana legally, um, and you have to get it from a licensed dispensary. Um, now, as far as how many of those there are, how many of those are going to be, or how many applied for permits, I don't have any of that knowledge yet. I just want to stress this is really in its infancy stage. Um, we're really trying to kind of catch up to uh, some of the legalities that, are, that we're now facing with, with uh, the legalization of marijuana to, to include, you know, what's DWI? How much marijuana is too much marijuana to drive a vehicle? 
Uh, you know, what are the courts going to say about that? We're going to talk a little bit in qualified immunity, but what if our officers arrest somebody who has THC in their system or a metabolite of that, um, but maybe they're not currently impaired because the effects of the marijuana have wor worn off? So there's a lot of question marks still, just like with any new law, pretty much, you know, how is this really going to pan out for us? As a police department, some of the steps we're taking, uh, so we had four canine uh, officers and their canine partners. Uh, all four were trained in the, de the, the detection of marijuana, and that is now no longer gonna be going to be probable cause to get into a vehicle or to a home or anything like that. So you can't untrain a dog to smell weed. You gotta, you know, just get a new dog to smell weed. If you, and the dogs don't do. put up the right paw when it's they marijuana, don't, yeah. the left paw when it's cocaine. They don't do like two circles yeah. counterclockwise if it's gonna be heroin. It's so they're hitting on a drug. It's just a drug, yep. Um, so we no longer are using those dogs that are trained to detect marijuana. We're not using them to detect any drugs at all, period, at all. So they're not retired. We use them for other things, um, searches and stuff, but we don't use them to detect narcotics. Now we did just get two brand new dogs that are going to be certified in narcotics that are not marijuana. So they'll be uh, you know, able to alert on other drugs, but, but they will not be trained on marijuana. So there'll be no sort of you know, cross-contamination of these dogs are smelling weed when it's really cocaine. Um, and we're, our plan is to eventually retire all four of those dogs and get four brand new dogs, all with the ability to still do narcotic searches because they've never been trained in marijuana. Hopefully that made sense. That was kind of confusing, but... Um, I understood. You understood it? And that's I all that really matters. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if you have questions, by the way, on this, go ahead. Th th this has been a topic that, you know, we've been in CPAC meetings. We've been in a bunch of meetings where um, the marijuana really has been a concern for people. And I think it's because they just don't understand the changes that are about to take place. We are trying to understand the changes that are going to take place. Uh, but we are also kind of working through that, too. So if you have a question, please uh, post that to the chat and we will answer it, you know, as we're talking about this. But some of the things the Farmington Police Department's uh, also doing besides that is, you know, we got to face the issue now of, okay, um, what are you going to do with employees and candidates to be police officers that have smoked marijuana recently? You know, are you allowed to smoke weed in the parking lot and come in and take a polygraph test and then be a cop the next day? So we're kind of working through some of that as, okay, you know, how long is too long? We would like to see some good decision making on the part of candidates that are coming in to be police officers. But, you know, is legal marijuana going to affect how we recruit people, what we ask in pre-employment questionnaires, uh, things like that. Eventually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna speak out of turn here, but eventually my, my gut feeling is telling me is we have 18 states now that have legalized recreational marijuana, and I don't know how many have medical marijuana, but, but a lot. Um, I think the United States Supreme Court's probably gonna have to rule on this at some point, and I think the federal government's probably gonna have to do some sort of um, clarification on what they want. Because right now, marijuana, is the same schedule of narcotics, what's so in the same class as methamphetamine and things like that, where, where the federal government's saying there's still no medicinal value to marijuana. That's how they're scheduling it, that's how they're classifying it. So until the federal government kind of cleans up some of that language, um, it's gonna be tough for us. Uh, I think nationwide, we just need to all get on the same page. Either it's all legal or it's all not legal. This picking and choosing when and where is making it a little bit harder uh, I think for people to comprehend, which is a little bit where we were with gay marriage as well. Right, they don't act. Yeah, states were beginning to uh, to implement it in certain areas, and then other states were not. And so, if you're married in this state and you go over to this uh, this state that doesn't recognize it, now what happens? What happens with benefits for partners and things like that? Eventually, the Supreme Court ruled one way or the other. In this case, the the court said those marriages are legal across the country, and that's kind of where we're at on on marijuana. So we're stuck a little bit. Because uh, as police officers, it's still illegal under federal law. So it's, it's, you know, whether it's a good idea or not, we'll talk a little bit. But um, in, in this case, you can't have officers that are smoking pot uh, and, and then being police officers, according to the feds. Uh, but, you know, equally, I think we've got, uh, we've got the battle. What's this going to look like down the road? If, if it's legal, just like alcohol, and everybody's, and everybody's using pot, how are we going to be able to recruit officers that don't? Uh, so everybody else in the country can do it, but you cannot. Uh, if you work in our records division, if you work in dispatch, you will not be able to do marijuana. That'll be, we're already struggling to recruit. That'll really shrink the pool of, of potential applicants for us. So that is a concern for us. And then in general, if we're going to say, okay, people, people actually can smoke marijuana and be police officers, what's that look like if our officers get into a shooting 
and we do the blood test uh, like we do right now when our officers are in shootings, and there's THC in their system. You know, do we feel comfortable as a society with, with police officers making life and death decisions even though they recently smoked marijuana? And I, I think, you know, the effects, we, we don't know. The, the state legislature actually kind of punted on the issue as far as DWIs go, is how much in your system it represents impairment to operate a vehicle. So that really leaves us murky as, as a chief sitting here trying to figure out, okay, what, what is the THC level? If it stays in your system 30 days after you do it, uh, but it's legal to be doing nightly if you want to. Uh, am I going to have police officers five years from now that are that are smoking pot and then coming to work shift uh, the next day? And and what does that look like if that happens? So I think there's a lot of questions. We don't have all the answers. You know, we're struggling to figure them out too as we go along. But I think some of it's going to you know wash out through the courts. Some of it's going to wash out through the legislature, and we're just going to have to be patient as this process goes on. And some of the questions I've personally been asked is, okay, what if my, what if my neighbor's smoking it and I can smell it? Um, and it's affecting me. It's affecting my quality of life now, the air quality and all that. Well, if they're smoking at their home, there's nothing we can do about it. Okay, well, what if they have kids in the house? Okay, well, if they smoke cigarettes with kids in the house, we still don't arrest them for child abuse or child neglect. You know, you know depending on impairment level, you know, we don't arrest people who are intoxicated. You're allowed to drink and have children in the house. Some people have very strong feelings about this and they're emo emotionally attached to one side or the other, which makes it a little more difficult too because the feeling that, like the chief says, there's a lot of people that feel like police officers should never be high. You should never be high. If you want to be a cop, you can't do weed. You know, and we're not going to go into our feelings on that, but, you know, well, we won't go into our feelings. <laughs> but, so it's, it's the same of, okay, so if I go to a house and I see paraphernalia and I see marijuana, but the kids are being taken care of, they got food on the table, they got clean diapers, they got clean clothes, you know, it's not going to be uh, any type of criminal offense to smoke weed in your house, even if the children are around. So then they're going to have to clarify a lot of that <laughs> language, I think. It'll, it'll be up to some lawyers and some, you know, some lawsuits, I'm assuming, to kind of clarify, okay, when and where is it okay? And how much is okay? How, how impaired can you be before you're too impaired to take care of your own children? So those are just some of the personal questions I've been you know, asked, uh, and they're tough, they're tough to answer, honestly. Well, and I, I think it's important to, to explain that Employers have individual rights as employers to, to dictate what's allowed for their employees, right? So HR, uh, your human resources department, would be a good place to start if you have questions about whether or not you can partake in marijuana and then come to work the next day. Right. Um, and that's regardless if you're a police officer or not. You know, yeah. some people uh, have CDL licenses and yep. things like that that dictate those types of things. And so they, they should really look into it before they do it because it could affect them adversely uh, without them even intending it to do so. Sure. Sounds like this is an evolving conversation. It is. is. Everyone yes, it is. is, as these things get maybe figured out either in the court system or from more legislation or, or city council or, or what have you. <laughs> I don't want to run out of time before we talk about the qualified immunity um, legislation, which is another big topic for all of you, of course. and. Uh, law enforcement in general. Chief, can you uh, get us going on that one? So this was a popular one, uh, Scott, if you remember last summer, it really started in the wake of the George Floyd killing. Uh, let's get rid of qualified immunity for police officers. That citizens should be able to sue officers personally uh, was where this started. Uh, it has been the case in some states, Colorado I know, you can sue police officers personally up to $25,000 I think is the limit on that. Um, in New Mexico it started with a, a governor commission that met last fall. Uh, studied it. I think they called it the Civil Rights Commission. Um, studied the issue. Uh, it was a split decision uh, on that on that panel whether or not this was a good idea. Uh, all of the law enforcement personnel on it uh, said no, and all of the other people on it said yes. So it proceeded off to the legislature in the wake of that, and it was uh, expanded and then tweaked. So it expanded in that it's not just police anymore. It's any government official. Uh, can be sued with the singular exceptions of, of politicians, and so our legislature cannot be, and judges. Uh, everybody else, uh, CYFD, fire, teachers. animal control, teachers, uh, they all can be sued under this new law. It's called HB4. Um, so that's, that was the expansion of it. And then the, the tweak to it was, uh, in the face of, of really strong uh, concern that you would not get police officers and now pay perhaps teachers and things like that if they were going to be personally held liable and they took that 
provision out of it. So qualified immunity in, in a form still exists. Uh, the individual is not held responsible. The agency is held responsible. So if a police officer is sued for violating someone's civil rights, uh, which, which actually happens, uh, right now the police department uh, slash the city of Farmington would pay whatever the verdict is in that. So the officer is not held personally responsible. You're not actually getting the, the officer's money and, and suing them personally. You're suing the agency. Uh, that, that was a concession meant to still allow departments to, to successfully recruit and not have officers quitting. Uh, there was a lot of chatter of that across the state. I was, uh, until September 1st, I was president of the New Mexico Chiefs Association, and there was widespread concern in the spring uh, that departments were going to lose officers uh, if HB4 passed, uh, as it had originally been intended last summer. Uh, it did not. So, you know, what you have now is a great expansion of, of under state law, of who can be sued uh, to include all government officials, uh, which, which impacts many individuals who previously wouldn't have thought they could be sued. Uh, but teachers uh, definitely are, are uh, a topic that, that can be sued, as well as principals and other school staff. Uh, but, but others like C CYFD, uh, the state police, everybody that's in government uh, qualifies for it. So we don't really know what the impact's going to be. You know, I have. Uh, I have significant concerns about some of it, but uh, I will tell you it's early and we, we haven't seen it. One thing that does tie in, though, is, is what you see with the marijuana legislation that we were just talking about. Uh, so when our officer stops somebody for driving under the influence of alcohol, uh, they take the subject, he does a breath test, the breath test shows how much alcohol is in the system. That's the evidence that, that proves that the individual is under the influence at that time. Uh, in the case of marijuana right now, because the legislature kind of punted on the decision, there is no test. So when our officers stop somebody out in the field, they're going to put them through a, a series of field sobriety tests. They're going to make a decision whether or not this individual fails the, the field sobriety test and, and is therefore under the influence and shouldn't be driving. But if they are, then there is no test that allows us to, to move forward with a case. So if, you, if it's a first or second uh, marijuana or a DWI arrest, the police cannot get a search warrant for blood. And it's the blood that would prove that there's THC in the system. Now, if it's a felony level DUI, then we can get a search warrant. So if, if this is a repeat individual, uh, we, we will be able to make those cases. But for first or second offenses, we will not be able to make those cases. How that ties in with HB4 is, so now the police have arrested someone, taken away their, their civil rights, uh, the case is then dismissed for lack of, of being able to conclusively prove it, and the individual then sues, alleging that the police department violated their civil rights by making the arrest in the first place. And that has actually already happened to us as an agency. So that is, that is something that, uh, unfortunately, when the legislature punts on this and then passes this, you really leave the police in a, in a miserable spot to try and enforce some of these laws. And how that's all going to wash out, you know, I don't really know. I, I do know that there's a chief uh, that I spoke with a few months back the insurance for their city canceled them after HB4 was passed. They wound up getting a new insurance carrier. Uh, their, their premiums were significantly higher, and the amount that taxpayers were going to have to pay before it got to the insurance had also gone way up. Uh, so they, they were worried what the ramifications were of it. So I think we're going to have to watch over the next couple of years to see what does happen. Uh, I know Albuquerque was extremely worried about this legislation and how much it was going to cost them. Obviously, they're, they're a huge uh, city. Uh, you know, for our for our purposes, I think we do a pretty good job of, of monitoring our uh, our lawsuits and what our officers are getting into, and and then acting, either changing policy or training, or defending ourselves when when we actually didn't do anything wrong. Uh, and so, you know, we're we're going to watch and see. But HB four is definitely something that that changes the landscape uh, as it relates to the city. And chief, I guess maybe there some that might say, shouldn't that then go back down to the officers on the street, just saying every every arrest should be a strong arrest that holds up to this type of scrutiny, or is that not the case because the legislation isn't there to, to help with that? You know, you, you want to, but if you, if you recall, the, the standard for a police officer to make an arrest is probable cause, that an individual probably did it. And, and based on that, then we, we wind up arresting an individual, like the DUI that I'm talking about. We don't know for sure when we're standing out in the field that he's under the influence, we, we, but we make an arrest, we take him someplace, he has to do a breath test, we gather the rest of the evidence. So the case continues. Um, in, in the case of, of then actually getting convicted, well, it's beyond a reasonable doubt. 
So then it's, it's a, a much higher standard. So you will have many arrests that don't end in convictions or they end in some sort of lesser um, you know, plea bargain down. So th how that will change under HB4, I'm not really sure. Uh, it could be that officers uh, become far more reluctant to make arrests based on probable cause. Uh, and, uh, and what you'll see then is you know, that some cases won't get closed because we don't feel that we're going to be able to prove it in court eventually. I see. Thank you for that. And we had, a, you know, just to kind of add on to that, it was uh, a defense attorney that kind of, you know, crafted this bill. And then what he was able to do was also put in uh, millions of dollars of a higher cap into it, too. So it didn't just, it didn't just take away certain things. It actually added a dollar amount uh, much higher than, you know, was originally in, in the laws for each occurrence of these. So, and you're right, so officers do think of that. Now, you know, now I, I'm potentially facing millions of dollars of liability to my agency when I'm making an arrest that I feel at, in the heat of the moment, in, the, in, the, in that second, in that time was a good arrest. Nothing malicious, no ill intent, just made, it, made an arrest based on the evidence I have. Well, then the conviction doesn't come through later. What's that gonna mean? Um, so there are those second guessing uh, that, that's already occurring. Uh, we're trying to just kind of put officers' minds at ease about it. Just say, do the right thing for the right reasons, and, and we'll take care of you. Gotcha. Very interesting. Thank you very much. Let me go back to Nicole, um, who may have another question from uh, Facebook viewers. We do. So since you think the New Mexico Civil Rights Act will not do what it's supposed proposed to do, is there something you think that would help ensure officers are not violating people's civil rights? And what does FPD do, FPD do about this already? So that's, I mean, that's an excellent question. And, um, I actually spent a lot of time in the fall and, and then in the spring in front of the legislature talking about this very topic. And there, there's many things wrong with HB4, but the biggest of them was the presentation that it was going to improve policing when it has almost no chance of improving policing. So when the bill was initially, uh, it was on the verge of, of being passed, uh, it was three years. You could sue three years after an incident occurred and, and then still sue the police department. So as a chief, how would I possibly change anything in my department when for three years I didn't even know anything was wrong? Nothing was brought forward to us. So for three years, uh, we just continued to operate the same way. So again, the presentation that it's, it's fixing things is just, it's laughable. It, it isn't going to fix anything. Uh, what is going to fix things, though, is more investment in training. You have to train officers. We have to invest in, in, our, in our police academy that's down in Santa Fe. And that has been unbelievably underfunded. And I talked about it repeatedly during, during the session because they were, they were at like 40% staffing. So 40% of the trainers that they needed to train every new police officer that comes into New Mexico. And this is, this is the investment that we're making in ensuring that officers know what they're supposed to do and then are doing it correctly. So that, that was the first thing. You've got to do a better job on training. Secondly, you've got to make things easier for chiefs to enforce rules. So the, the year before, we actually passed a law that now allows unionization and gave unions, in particular police unions, vast new powers with which to resist discipline and, and make it harder for chiefs to get rid of bad cops. And the irony of that is I was on, down at the legislature and I was telling legislators, you were going to make it harder for police chiefs to get rid of bad cops. And then three months later, George Floyd happens and everybody wants to know why we can't get rid of bad cops. Well, we actually just went a big step towards making it more difficult. So there was a lot of things that we could have done that would have been more effective. We should be hiring better people, we should be training them better, and then we should be getting rid of bad cops and getting rid of them faster. So the decertification process uh, down in Santa Fe has been just brutal. They were, uh, there was a backlog of about 120 of them. Uh, my understanding is they've actually now started to, to make progress over the last few months on that. But, but those, would, those decertifications were going two and three years where an officer still had a certificate, still could be a police officer, even though his department was telling the state, this guy should not be a police officer. We needed faster hearings, we still need them, faster hearings that give the officer due process, and if they're not a, a fit for policing, then we need to get them out of the business. Those are things that are gonna improve policing. You know, being able to sue people three years after the event isn't gonna fix much. Now, they eventually did change this at the last dog howl, and, uh, and I was pleased to see it. For law enforcement agencies, you can sue for up to one year after the event. For other parts of, of government, it still remains three years. But they were actually listening on that. Otherwise, I'd, I'd have no hope of fixing policing if I didn't even know something was going wrong until the lawsuit hits three years later. And I guess, Chief, this all comes back again to the recruitment question that we're talking about this evening as well, right? You're, you're trying to get new 
recruits to come in, new officers to come through that are going to be with you for maybe 20, 30 years, and uh, and they're looking at some of these things that are that are happening, um, and maybe having second thoughts about law enforcement as a career or or not. But uh, I imagine it's just one thing that you have to deal with. It it definitely is. It, so I mean, there isn't there isn't an easy answer uh, to to almost any question in life. This one definitely is multifaceted. You definitely want to hold officers accountable when they're when they're doing bad things and. And believe me when I say we spend a significant amount of time at the PD investigating our officers. We have two sergeants that do nothing but investigate police misconduct. And then we have two officers that do nothing but investigate police use of force. So we scrutinize our officers. We have a standard. We discipline significantly at the PD. Uh, but that said, we do many, many things great. We have many great people that work for us. And, and most of the time, our officers are out there doing just a fantastic job. And those are the people we're trying to encourage you to come in and work for us. Um, but, but that stress over the top, it definitely makes people hesitant. Sure. Can I kind of piggyback on that? Yeah, yeah. sorry. So, uh, you know, the Chief's right. It's that stress, that it's, that's a, the anxiety of the unknown that I think a lot of them are facing, too. So we're asking people to come be police officers, but they know full well it's going to be months down the road that we're doing background investigations and medical evaluations and polygraph examinations. And we're doing all this stuff where... They can go to Starbucks or Target and make you know fifteen dollars an hour in some places and get full tuition. Um, so they're thinking to themselves, you know, and I, and we've seen signs that work today get paid today. So they can go to a place, get a job today because of the way the labor market currently is, get their tuition completely paid for, and not have to face all this extra scrutiny. That that you know we're trying to tell you, hey, come protect your community. This is the place you want to be, and and that's true. That is what we want, but we're also battling. Okay, but I could go do something and have less anxiety about all of that and not have to worry about, am I going to get sued for something I thought was right? You know, so now it's convincing these people too, like, well, you know, don't worry about that because if that happens, we'll have your back um, as long as you were doing what was right. If, if you're doing what was wrong, you know, you're on your own. But it's still, it's just the market we're in too, it's tough to recruit because there is this nationwide negative narrative that is plaguing police departments of, you know, this bad cop syndrome of, or some people call it the bad apple or whatever. You guys don't get rid of the bad apple because the whole bunch is already spoiled. And so now we're convincing people, hey, come work for us. Don't listen to the nationwide narrative. Farmington loves you. San Juan County loves you. Um, and it's just convincing them that that actually is true when they're hearing so much stuff from the media, especially social media and, and TikTok and Snapchat and the tweeters and all that. It's, it's making it worse for us to um, convince them that this is the noble profession that we all know it is. Sure. Well, and, it, and every police department is different, I would, Absolutely. I would, I would say, oh, yeah, too. Yeah, no doubt. And each department has different support from, from their community, and I think you all um, enjoy uh, wide-ranging support in the community of Farmington, and that does not come easy sometimes, and there's a lot of uh, things that go into that, transparency, I think, being one, communication being another, and just, uh, you know, talking to the public in events kind of like, like this one. Yes, well, and, it, and it's reciprocal respect, too. They're not going to just believe us just because we're the police and we say it happened. You got to build that trust, and you got to build that relationship, and in a lot of cases, you got to build that friendship to where they actually respect what they're saying because they know you respect what they're saying then to them. You know, these community forums are a great way to do that because we are listening to what they say. We are listening, and we're and, and we're going to actively try to change the things we can change. It's not just a hey, thanks for showing up tonight. You know, pat on the back and move along. It's hey, thanks for the the valuable input you provided. We're now going to go try to make ourselves better. So without, without that reciprocal respect, we, you know, we can't just expect it to be one way. Um, and I think they appreciate that from us as well. Well, and I think we have seen that, unfortunately, th this goodwill can change in an instant mm -hmm. with an unfortunate situation. And so, yeah. again, um, it's only as good as, as the conditions allow and, and how you all react to it yes. in the communities. You know, I, I think we do, we do some of these things, and, and obviously the chief, you know, I, I direct the direction of the agency. but. The support we have in the community really, uh, to me, comes down to what are they seeing the officers do on the street? I mean, we can, we can sing and Taft can dance. He definitely can. Very well. Um, very yeah. well. And, no. and maybe we'll do that someday. <laughs> but we can sing and dance up here for you. But if what you're seeing from our officers on the street doesn't match that, then it doesn't matter. And, and you don't have community trust. I think what you see from our officers is a sincere interest in doing the right thing, that they truly are trying to help people. Uh, even when they're in dangerous situations, our officers still keep their cool. Uh, we released the footage from, from all our officer-involved shootings. Uh, I think what you see there is professional officers working their best to, to stay safe and to keep other people safe. And you can't hide that from the public. So it either is or it isn't. And if it isn't, then the, the public doesn't trust you. But here I think that they, 
uh, for good reason. I think that they do trust our officers. And if somebody makes the wrong choice out there, Chief, I mean, I think it's been your policy to get rid of them, discipline them, or, or whatever the case may be, but do it as quickly as, as you can. Is that one of your personal, I guess, policies when, you, when it comes to policing? It definitely is. Uh, you know, I think for the public's sake, uh, the public deserves uh, us to move quickly. Um, on the shootings, we talk with you pretty quickly. Here's, here's what happened. Here's what the process is going to be. Within a week or two, the, the statements have been done. We have some idea of what's gone on in the investigation. We give you the feedback on that, and we release the footage of, of the video. There isn't a lot of mystery to, to this, and there really shouldn't be. Uh, you, you've entrusted us to keep you safe and to keep your community safe, and we recognize that as an absolute solemn obligation of ours, and, and we react quickly to it. Unfortunately, we've had a few, uh, it hasn't been a ton, in my time here, but we have had a few uh, pretty spectacular failures. Uh, those, those are absolutely mine as the chief. Uh, they're mine to fix, and, and we try and do that as, as fast as we can while still telling you what's going on. Uh, there isn't a whole lot to hide. Uh, people make mistakes. We've got 170-some people that work for us, including me. Uh, people make mistakes, but we do the best that we can to quickly address those and figure out what went wrong and then uh, you know, make it right. And that's important. And uh, 170, but you can still use some more. We could still use some more. <laughs> All yes, right, sir. very good. Another plug in for recruitment. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we are about out of time, everyone. Uh, Nicole, no other questions coming in, as far as we know. No, correct? no weed questions, huh? No. Everybody's just happy at the moment. They're just, so. they're just out enjoying the newfound freedoms. There you go. <laughs> Eating there, Doritos. There was a question that came in from Instagram um, before the event this evening, and I think it kind of sums up a lot of folks in the community. Just thank all of you and, and the men and women of the Farmington Police Department for all the work that you do each and every day. Um, they just want to thank you for the job and the risks that you all take each and every time you put the uniform on. Uh, they write that they are personally grateful and want you all to know that they, they pray for your safety, and I think it's a good question to end on. So thank you all very, very much. So I do, I do appreciate that, that comment. I would, you know, I would really hasten to point out uh, the, the four of us, uh, we still wear the uniforms. Uh, me in particular, it's more of a baseball manager. I wear the same uniform and I'm not really playing the same game. Our officers on the street, they're 21, 22, 23 years old, and they actually have their life on the line uh, when they're out there. Uh, just, bef just before we came down here to, to have this session, the four of us were in a meeting. We were looking at a video of two of our officers that were engaged in a traffic stop. The individual was lying to us about who he was. Um, eventually, they, uh, they tell him that he needs to step out of the car. He tries to jump in the driver's seat to, to take off. They wrestle him out of the car. They're trying to wrestle him into handcuffs. Uh, in the course of that, one of them yells, gun. The individual has reached into, his, uh, into the front of his pants, and he, he actually has a gun in his hand while the officers are grappling with him. Uh, one of the officers is on top of him. He's able to control him enough that the other officer is able to wrestle away the gun throws the gun away, we're able to get the individual into custody. There's three other people in the car that are, that are giving the officers a hard time that are not complying. Uh, the fact is, although there are spectacular failures in law enforcement and, and we focus on those in life, uh, and as a, as a community definitely we, we have over the last few years, the truth is day in and day out our officers are out there and they actually have their life on the line and they're doing a fantastic job. And when I watched that video, I was so proud of the officers involved, they, they aren't raising their voice. Uh, they're, they're calm, they're directive, they're, they're making good teamwork decisions. They, they're able to get out of this. There's no officer involved shooting. They're able to make an arrest on a dangerous individual who's now in prison uh, for various crimes. Wasn't his first rodeo. And, and we're able to, to do all of that with minimal injury to people around. And that is, that is what we expect of our officers as a, as a society. But that is a very, very difficult standard to meet every single day, every single time. And we have to have some tolerance for the fact that there are going to be failures. And now it is my job as chief to ensure those are minimal failures and that we've got the policies and training in place to make sure that those don't happen often. But if you watch these two officers, they are the absolute cream of the crop that we have as a society. And, and they are doing a fantastic, difficult job that is too often overlooked by the, the blunders of a few. So the, the Packers have a great quarterback. He'll throw four touchdowns and <coughs> remember the one interception. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank yeah, you. Uh, I'm sorry to say, but thank you for that. And we'll uh, talk about the Packers later. There, there you go. Thank you. I'm sure you'll entertain lots of questions <laughs> thank you. on the Facebook page for the Farmington Police Department. But that will bring us to an end for our community discussion this evening, everybody. We thank you for joining us, and I thank uh, the guests here on the panel. Deputy Chief uh, Tracy, thank you for being here. Um, Thanks for having Captain us. Dowdy, thank you for being here. Thanks, Captain Scott. Crum, thank you. And Chief, always a pleasure. Thank you for including me in this.
Yes, thank Scott. You thank you. You're Thanks welcome. for being part. I didn't say Buffalo Bills once. <laughs> no, you did not. <laughs> thank you all for joining us. I'm Scott Micklin from KSJE Radio at San Juan College. Have a good evening.